Hi everybody and uh, welcome back to another lecture in Anatomy 2. So this is going to be chapter 27 in half. This is going to be the sexual reproductive system specifically focusing on the male side and then we'll do a video specifically focusing on the female side uh, a little bit later on. So let's get rolling into this thing. A little bit of an introduction up front and uh, let's just see where this thing takes us. So away we go. Uh, so first things first a little bit of a conversation about chromosomal sex determination. So at this stage in your life, you should probably grasp that you, as a human, have 23 pairs of chromosomes. That is your diploid cell chromosomal count. All right, so uh, your normal bodily cells have 23 pair of chromosomes. That's 23 chromosomes that you got from your mom, 23 chromosomes that you got from your dad. And of those, 22 pairs are considered autosomes. And then the last set are referred to as the sex chromosomes. So if you look at this, this is a nice human karyotype displaying uh, human chromosomes, a human being, a person's chromosomes. And this particular individual comes from a male. You can tell this because they have 22 autosomes, as you can see. And then the final set, the 23rd pairing, there's one X chromosome and then one Y chromosome, which is much, much smaller. Okay, so the concept here is that mom has two X chromosomes and dad has an X and a Y chromosome. So when mom makes haploid gametes, okay, important term set here, mom is diploid, she has 23 pair of chromosomes, but when she makes a haploid gamete, an egg cell, that'll have only 23 total chromosomes. Not 23 pair, but 23 total chromosomes. So mom makes an egg, it's got 23 total chromosomes. Dad makes sperm, and those sperm cells will also have 23 total chromosomes. And the idea is that when egg and sperm meet, 23 chromosomes from the sperm cell, 23 chromosomes from the egg cell, what this does, it allows us to make a zygote, and that zygote will then be diploid. It'll have a 2N number, it'll be diploid, it'll have 23 pair of chromosomes. 23 from dad, 23 for mom, one functional cell that can then develop to become a living human being. And again, uh, an important nuance to this is that mom can only make eggs with X chromosomes. She can only make X chromosome based eggs because mom has two X chromosomes in terms of her sex chromosomes, whereas dad can make an X chromosome or a Y chromosome based uh, sperm. So the idea is uh, that if you get a sperm with an X chromosome that would develop into someone who is genetically female. And then uh, if you receive a Y chromosome, you would develop into someone who is genetically male, as with an X and a Y chromosome. So sex determination, that's sort of how this works, all right? So what the real function of this lecture is going to be is how, how do we get these two together? All right, and I, I'm pretty sure I just told you most of what I want to say, but I'm just going to lay it on you anyway. So uh, males and females, we make gametes, haploid cells. That would be half the normal chromosomal count. Again, you as an adult have 23 pair of chromosomes. The gametes you make, be that sperm or egg, will be haploid, meaning they have 23 total chromosomes, 23 total. Uh, if you were to get a haploid sperm with a haploid egg, they would merge together to form a 23 pair chromosome diploid zygote, okay? The zygote is indeed a fertilized egg. Now, an important little nuance to point out here, uh, one of the gametes, i.e. a sperm, is set up to be mobile, and as a result of the requirement of motility, sperm cells shed all their cytoplasm, man. I mean, they shed all their cytoplasm. At the end of the day, the sperm itself is very, very small, okay, very small and uh, doesn't live very long. It's not a hardy cell. They're easily killed. The sperm cells are incredibly small. They've shed all their cytoplasm because you got to think about this in terms of uh, their, their natural selective environment. The fastest sperm to get to the egg is the one that fertilizes it and passes on its genetics to the next generation. So there is going to be selective pressure for having the fastest sperm or uh, the fastest sperm amongst a group, if you will. So this is a way to think about this. And the other side of things, the egg, the egg is the exact opposite of this. Whereas a male is going to produce thousands of sperm a day, a female will produce one utilized or uh, 
viable, there we go, one viable egg theoretically a month. Um, and as a result of this, this single viable egg, and this is about the only image you're ever going to see of this, this is incredibly rare. Uh, there is a real human egg cell, and if you had that on, on your thumbnail, it would look about the size of a grain of salt. All right, so it's visible. These are the biggest cells, man, about the biggest cells in diameter of any cell in the human body. Absolutely massive. Again, this is a single cell, and you can see it resting on your thumbnail, about the size of a grain of sand. Uh, and that should give you an idea of how big the sperm cells are by comparison. Uh, but the nature of the, the female gamete, of the egg, is that it conserves its cytoplasm, okay? Whereas the sperm cells shed their cytoplasm in massive detail, like they really get rid of it, during development, the egg cells work very hard to conserve their cytoplasm, uh, basically to make an environment internally that can nourish development for a period of time uh, prior to implantation into the female endometrium. All right. All right, good. Uh, let's see, overview of the reproductive system. So the male reproductive uh, system does indeed serve a general purpose to introduce sperm into the female reproductive system and the female reproductive system's main goal here is to receive that sperm and then uh, nourish a viable embryo all right so basic concepts here is penis for copulation in males vagina for copulation in females uh, egg delivered via ovary through fallopian tube to be fertilized and then implanting into the uterus uh, and that's really about all I want to say here in terms of introduction. Oh, there's a few more things, little, little details down here. Um, so there are primary and secondary sex organs. So the primary sex organs are going to be the testis and ovaries, being that they produce the egg and sperm that are necessary. Uh, then we have a variety of secondary sex organs. In males, there's just this crazy array of ducts and glands, like you would not believe. Uh, the, the system from sperm out of the end of the penis here is probably like 35 meters or so like it or feet 35 feet or so 40 feet like it, it's a massive length uh, the tubules are all kind of compacted amongst one another but it's a really incredibly long distance to travel uh, with all sorts of glands and twists and turns uh, whereas in the female reproductive system, it, it's much more concise in the grand scheme of things. So we got this ovary, we have the fimbriae, and the uh, fallopian tube here. It's going to terminate into the uterus, and uh, that's sort of the extent of what we need. Now, there are obviously other uh, attributes here that are worthy of mention, and we'll get there when we do the female reproductive system, but for a sperm to travel through the male reproductive system is an incredibly long and arduous journey, uh, whereas an egg traveling through the fallopian tubes to the uterus is much more straightforward by comparison. Uh, and I, I don't know the exact details, I bet it's been researched, but I guarantee you this is going to play a role in only the fastest sperm, uh, i.e. the healthiest, uh, making it out of the system. That would make perfect sense from my perspective. Because if you're not aware, even minor variants in motility for sperm cause them to become completely inactive. Um, yeah. Yeah, that'll do. Uh, reproductive system. So we have secondary sexual characteristics that are worthy of mention here. Uh, these are going to be features that play a role in the different sexes in general mate attraction. Now I throw a turkey up here for a reason. As we go through, well, first let me say this. If we could take a nine-year-old male and female and strip them and shave them, you'd be pretty hard-pressed to tell the difference if they were wearing a fig leaf of back in the day, all right? Uh, it, it's hard to tell the differences between males and females pre-puberty. But as you well know, post-puberty, things change dramatically, i.e. we have our turkey. Here's a young turkey, okay? And here is a full-grown adult male turkey, uh, and they are obviously quite different in appearance. The same basically applies to us as humans. A uh, full-grown adult male, a full-grown adult female looks distinctly, distinctly different uh, from our young counterparts. So, what happens? Well, y you can probably guess. 
We develop a, a great deal of hair growth and activation of our sebaceous glands and our apocrine glands, which act as scent glands, at least that's our prediction, um, to work in the realm of mate attraction. Uh, also, the pitch of our voice changes, both in males and females. Males, as a result of testosterone, uh, there is a great deal more deepening, uh, much less emphasized in females, and a whole host of other features. So facial hair variations, the coarseness of hair on the body certainly changes as a result of testosterone. Uh, testosterone drives muscular development to some degree, so with excess testosterone in males you expect to see a more muscular build, and uh, general roughened features, if you will. All right, the, the jawline, the way that the jaw attaches to the skull, like the size of the hands, there, there is variations as a result of testosterone that are quite visible. Uh, and we can really see this when we look at people who have excessive testosterone development. Uh, so, I'm not going to get into a whole bunch of detail here, but you should totally go and look up excess testosterone and its effects upon the body. Now, female distribution, or female variants, I should say, by comparison, uh, the distribution of body fat is very different. Males tend to store fat around the belly, uh, whereas females tend to store fat around the hips. Uh, breast development certainly takes place as a result of the female system and the hormones in play here. Uh, body hair is dramatically uh, less visible, it tends to be much more fine by comparison to that shown by males, uh, and general softer features, softening of the features and skin. Uh, an interesting nuance in this, man, let me tell you something, this is fascinating, is uh, a, a concept that was started, I believe, in the 1600s and proceeded up until the early 1900s was the castrato, or the castrati for plural. Um, this is something you have never heard of, but I'm about to tell you about it. This fella here is a full-grown adult male, uh, but if you look at his features, they are quite soft because he was an incredibly super talented singer as a boy, all right? Uh, uh, young boy-based bands, boy bands being the joke here, I guess, but um, groups in the 1600s, 1700s, whom were excluded, like boys' choirs, or what these would have been referred to as, uh, were thought of as having incredibly pure voices, and on occasion, an incredibly talented young boy singer would be castrated, the testes removed, as a means of preventing him from going through puberty and allowing him to sing with this boy's voice, uh, not getting this deepening as a result of testosterone development uh, that you would see in a, a regular adult male. Uh, and again, these were referred to as the castrati or being a single castrato. And again, the last castrato died in, I believe, 1922, and that means that we have an actual recording of it. You should totally pause this video, go to this link, and listen to an actual castrato sing. Uh, this is something, you know, that's absolutely terrible from my perspective, but it is historically accurate and real. You should know about it. I think it's fascinating. And it just goes to show uh, that the influence of these hormones changes the body. Again, look at the features here. They're different. They're different than what you'd expect. Uh, and, and, you know, you can flip side the coin of this a little bit. Uh, you can go and look up... All right, so testosterone drives uh, excess muscular development. Uh, as a means of getting excess muscular development, some bodybuilders will take extra testosterone. And one of the unique features of this is looking at female bodybuilders whom have taken excess testosterone and they develop very masculine looking hands, very masculine looking jaw lines. Uh, the, the hormones play a role in the development of these secondary sexual characteristics and that's a really interesting nuance to this, all right? Uh, yeah, and I'm going to talk more about that in mere moments. It's just a neat little nuance to the development of the body. All right. Let's talk about developing embryos. So post-fertilization, first seven weeks or so, a fetus is uh, sexually incapable of being differentiated. You can't tell boy or girl. You can't wander into a uh, 3D ultrasound and identify a seven-week-old fetus and tell if it's male or female. Because you're born with everything needed to develop either way, in essence. All right? You're born with what's necessary to go one way or the other. 
uh, the gonads themselves, all right, be that uh, um, testes or ovaries, by the way, that look almost identical. If you take them out and put them on a table, you'd be hard-pressed to tell the difference. Uh, they'd begin to development about five or six weeks on, uh, but really don't get cranking until much later, okay? Now, in the realm of development, in terms of sexual differentiation, there are Wolfian ducts and there are Mullerian ducts, okay? Uh, these are separate tubes. You can see the Wolfian ducts here in greenish, if you will, and then the Mullerian ducts here in pink. And you'll note that here are the kidneys. We are way the heck up in the abdomen, okay? Way up there, really high, uh, you know, up around the kidneys. So both of these are going to have to migrate distinctly to get down to where they're going to eventually terminate. So uh, the Wolfian ducts, as seen here, uh, are going to develop into the male reproductive system, specifically the uh, spermatic cords and the testes, uh, and then the Mullerian or uh, paramizonephric, they're, mul they're Mullerian ducts. The Mullerian ducts uh, develop into the female reproductive system, okay, as seen here. Now, both of these will be pressed until about week seven. And after that, things begin to change as a result of what's called an SRY gene, okay? This is a, a, a gene that causes you, in essence, to be able to respond to androgens um, found in the Y chromosome. So this is going to be a male thing. So when the SRY gene is present and testosterone begins to be developed, you develop as a male, okay? The, um, what do you call them? The malarian ducts are going to go away and the Wolfian ducts will remain, whereas on the female side, no RSRY gene, uh, the malarian ducts remain and the um, uh, Wolfian ducts degenerate. So you can see how this happens, right? It's all about this SRY gene and the presence of testosterone right around, you know, week eight, week nine, developing and showing us uh, male versus female based off of the chromosomes present and the genes found on that chromosome. Yeah. Yeah. Is that all I want to say here? Let's do one more. Um, and that is androgen insensitivity syndrome, just for kind of kicks and giggles. Um, worthy of mention here is that it's possible to have a Y chromosome that is without certain genes or with malfunctioning genes. So your SRY gene does not work. So you develop as phenotypically female, but uh, incapable of producing offspring. There are no ovaries. There really are no testes. Uh, the exterior anatomy is very female-esque. So you'll develop as a female, uh, phenotypically external surface. Everything looks female. But when you do a blood test, there's a Y chromosome. All right. I should totally go and look up what happened at the uh, Olympics back in like 99 or something like that. Uh, they did a test for SRY genes in order to make sure that males weren't competing with females as a way of cheating. Uh, and a lot of, or well, several, several ladies popped up with a Y chromosome and it was because they were uh, not able to recognize testosterone. They had a malfunctioning SRY gene. Uh, pretty fascinating, pretty fascinating stuff. Just a few decades ago. Yeah. All right, hormonal control of sex, absolutely. So androgens being uh, mainly testosterone for our perspective cause the development of the uh, male reproductive organs and the development of our secondary sexual characteristics. And uh, here is a, a nuance to this. Testosterone drives male development, but females also make low levels of testosterone, okay? Just like females tend to have their reproductive um, parts driven by estrogen-based um, um, hormones, i.e. estradiol, uh, progesterones, uh, progesterone being key amongst these dry female reproductive traits. But worthy of mention here is that estrogen is also produced in males, just slight variants. The, the idea here is that SRY gene drives male development, uh, we still make some estrogen. Okay, so males produce lots of testosterone, a little bit, of, uh, lots of testosterone, a little bit of estrogen. Females produce many female-based hormones like estrogen, like progesterone, and some testosterone as well. Um, 
I would invite you to uh, pause this video again if you've got lots of time on your hands and go and watch this episode, or listen to, I should say, so radio show, this episode of This American Life about testosterone. Boy, it is an eye-opening experience uh, to look at males and their variations in testosterone, females, their variations in testosterone, and what happens when uh, a female, for example, has excess testosterone in the system. It is such an interesting story to tell. You should totally go and check that out. It's very neat. All right, <clears throat> an important note here. Estrogen levels are always high in pregnancy, okay? If estrogen was a hormone that makes for female development, all fetuses would be feminized, but that is not the case. Female development occurs because an absence of androgen-based hormones and an absence of that SRY gene. Take the SRY gene away from a male, you develop as female, all right? Uh, it's, it's an interesting nuance, an interesting nuance. So it's all, it's all about this SRY gene, really. Yeah. All right, a little bit of a, a point to be made here. We have incredibly similar anatomy. Okay, incredibly similar anatomy. Um, externally, early on in development, it's very, very difficult indeed to identify male versus female. So you can actually go through and look at this stuff. Uh, you've got this genital tubercle, about six weeks genital tubercle, a urogenital fold, labioscrotal folds here, and even a tail present still at this stage. Uh, you should totally pause this video and go look at some folks that developed with tails uh, at birth. Uh, they can remain in certain cases, uh, but as we develop, as, as we develop, I should say, around 10 weeks, uh, you begin to see variations here. So you can see the glands of the penis and then the clitoris developing on the opposing side from this genital tubercle. You can see the uro, uh, urethral groove forming here in the male, and it's eventually going to close up, whereas it stays open here on the female side of things uh, to seal a bit later on. Again, parts of these urogenital folds and the labioscrotal folds, the labioscrotal folds will develop into a scrotum on the male side and the labia majora on the female side. And then bam, here we go, 12 weeks, uh, 12 weeks, 12 weeks, you can really see differentiation happening here. Uh, the opening for the urethra, for example, and its location. This perennial raft is very fascinating how it orients itself. You can see the clitoris versus the penis uh, glands here, uh, the labia versus the scrotum kind of an interesting way to look at this and if you pull up heck i thought i had a better picture of this but i guess i didn't put it on here what did i do i i know i had it on here but i guess i somehow removed it anyway is it on another slide anyway moving on um if you look at a 10 week old um fetus boy it's hard to tell the difference eventually though around 12 weeks uh, there it went again 12 week winks Dyslexia is hard. Uh, around 12 weeks, you can indeed begin to see the variations happening here. And my main goal of this, what I really want you to get, uh, is that we are more similar than we are dissimilar. Okay, our parts develop from the same parts. It's just minor tweaks in certain chromosomes. It's minor variations in uh, hormone levels that drive us to develop in the ways in which we develop. And that all falls back to our genetics. Yeah, perfect. And, uh, oh man, look at that, totally messed that up. Uh, one more little point to make here, and that is about the development of these parts. This happens way up at the kidneys, as I said previously. So there's quite a trip to take uh, for our parts to get down where they are eventually supposed to be, especially on the male side. There is a structure referred to as a gubernaculum uh, that will actually aid in guiding the testis way down from the kidneys out of the body via what are called the inguinal rings. Again, the testes are found on the outside of the body, out through the body and all the way down into the scrotal sac uh, for development to take place. So this happens at about seven months of age, uh, finally occurs. So a newborn baby, you don't feel testes there in most cases because the testicle is not yet fully uh, dropped, if you will. Yeah. I'm pretty happy. Now, in, in males, the uh, gubernaculum sort of goes away, but in females, it actually becomes a set of ligaments that helps ho hold the ovaries and the uterus in place. Uh, that's kind of an interesting little nuance as well. All right, good, 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 good. Let's go here. All right, here it is, folks. We are now beginning our conversation of the male reproductive system. 
And boy, is this a can of worms. There, there's a lot to talk about here. Uh, I'm going to try to do it quick. My goal here is to run through this at some level of speed because I don't want this level or this video to take forever. I see we're at virtually 25 minutes already. So <laughs> let me see if I can blaze a trail through the rest of this. Ah, uh, you. Well, hang on. I guess easiest place to start is at the testis. So here we have our gonad. We have the testis itself encased in the scrotum, held on the outside of the body because sperm don't develop at regular body temperature. They got to be cold. Okay, they got to be cooler than regular body temperature, so they're held externally. Again, you can see this opening at the inguinal ring here, where the vas deferens, ductus deferens, would move out of the body and down, as carried there by the gubernaculum we talked about previously. So we have our testis. Uh, the, with, encased within the scrotum. On the back of the testis is the epididymis. The epididymis is very important because that's where sperm do their uh, maturation process and where they are stored prior to ejaculation. Now, the ductus or vas deferens, as seen here, moves all the way up and terminates in an ampulla. And the ductus deferens, man, like it's easily palpated through the skin. This thing is is solid. It's like steel cable. It's incredibly muscular, which makes perfect sense because for the ejaculatory process to take place, you got to get sperm from the epididymis up and out quickly. Uh, so this is a super muscular tube. Okay, the ductus deferens is very capable of peristalsis and very forceful contractions to force material uh, through its length quite quickly. All right. So ductus deferens up and around to the ampullae of the ductus deferens storage area. Uh, and then these seminal vesicles kind of duct into this. So the seminal vesicle uh, makes a lot of the uh, seminal fluids, if you will. That's going to connect into the ductus deferens, move through what's called an ejaculatory duct, and then terminate here in the prostate. So the prostate gland is here, makes a lot of seminal fluids as well. And this is the final conglomeration, if you will, prior to ejaculating through the urethra and then out of the penis. Now, one little nuance to this are these bulbo-urethral glands, one on each side of the penis, uh, left and right, I should say. And these bulbo-urethral glands, prior to the whole ejaculatory process, will pr like sort of prep the passages, if you will. Uh, they will make an alkaline solution that neutralizes any acidity found within the uh, penis itself. And the fluid produced by these bulbo-urethral glands are thought to lubricate the end of the penis prior to uh, copulation, if you will. So this is part and parcel of the process. Now, in and of the penis itself, uh, what I want you to know is this corpus cavernosa, one on each side of the penis, you'll see that more later. And then at the base, you have this corpus spongiosum that surrounds the urethra itself. And these are the erectile tissues of the penis. And um, that's good enough for me, I think. Yeah, I, I think we're good. And we get the glands here, uh, highly innervated. You get, you get the idea. All right, good, 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 good. Let's go here. So the scrotum, uh, there's a couple of neat things to point out here. Again, uh, the testis has to be held at a cool temperature. And to do this, the scrotum is held external to the body, but it can't get too cold. It can't get too hot. So there is a way, there are three ways built in to maintain testicular temperature. These are involving the cremaster muscles, the dartos muscles, and what's called the pampiniform plexus, okay? Uh, the cremaster muscles, as you can see here, are, are uh, skeletal. They are associated directly with the testis. They come down from the abdominal oblique. And again, let me point out this inguinal ring here. Uh, this uh, opening, if you will, that allows the spermatic cord to m run through. This is going to cause males to have extremely high risk of hernias by consider or comparison to females. Uh, the whole idea of a hernia is that parts of the viscera can get through the body wall. And these inguinal rings where the spermatic cord passes... Uh, are going to be a inset weakness in the abdominal wall, facilitating hernias far more common in males than females. Anyway, cremaster muscle, skeletal. The dartos muscle is a little more fascinating from my uh, perspective. It's more associated with the scrotal sac and the skin itself. And what this is going to do is it's going to allow the scrotum to be pulled up to the body to keep the testes warm in the cold. And then by comparison, when you're hot, the testes will fall down and be held further away from the body in order to maintain that optimal sperm development temperature about 34 degrees Celsius. And then last but not least, in and amongst this is the pampiniform plexus. This is this crazy branching network of veins that run through this spermatic cord, if you will, the, 
the uh, all the tissue holding the testes in place. And if you look at this, all of these blood vessels here, all of this venous territory uh, is going to work to cool the arterial blood on the way down. So you get this nice cool blood running up from the testes. It's going to cool the arterial blood on the way down in order to keep arterial blood from heating up the testes uh, in a um, adverse way, you might say. This is referred to as a counter current heat exchange method, counter current heat exchanger. So as one current's running this way, the other current's going that way, and they're exchanging heat. And the idea is heat from the arterial network is going to be pulled into the venous network, uh, leading to pretty cool blood from the arterial network arriving at the testis to provide oxygen and nutrients and what have you. Uh, let's run through the pathway of sperm real quick. So what we have here is the testicle itself sectioned. You can see the tunica albigenia on the outside here. Uh, this is going to be tissue connective that sort of helps to divide things up into <clears throat> lobules inside the testis. So these lobules are going to be just jam-packed with what are called seminiferous tubules, folks. So the testis is broken up into lots of lobules. One testis, 250 lobules, uh, and in and amongst this, these seminiferous tubules will be found. And they are muscular, so they are per peristaltic. They have the ability to sort of run peristalsis and take sperm, which are developing inside of here. Again, here's a real seminiferous tubule. You can see the sperm tails. Uh, these are going to be immature sperm that will break loose from the seminiferous tubule and then run through the lobule and get into, number two here, the retae testis. From the retae testis, uh, basically just a little area where the sperm are meandering their way through. Minor development taking place here. They'll run into these efferent ductules. As you can see here, the efferent ductules are important because they are ciliated to help pull the sperm to where they're supposed to be. And then we run into the body of the epididymis. Okay, uh, The body, the head of the epididymis, all of this here, it's incredibly lengthy. It's about 20 feet long. It's just all kind of cramped in together, but it's a super long tube. And the idea is that the sperm take a long time to flow through this crazy long tube, somewhere on the order of 20 days, before they eventually arrive at the tail of the epididymis, um, where they are going to be mature and developed and ready to do what they do. They're not swimming at this stage, but they're ready to swim. They are prepared. Uh, and sperm can live in here for 40 to 60 days, a, a period of time. Now, uh, when ejaculation takes place, okay, when, when the process has begun, they're going to be pulled from this epididymis and then thrown through the ductus deferens or the vas deferens and pushed up uh, towards the seminal vesicles and all that fun stuff. Um, there's something I was going to say. Oh, why not? Let's talk about a vasectomy real quick, just because. So a vasectomy is an incredibly, incredibly accurate means of birth control for a couple. So what they do in a vasectomy is they'll come in, they'll cut the vas deferens and cauterize both ends and separate them. Uh, and that will prevent sperm from running back up to uh, be released from the body. The sperm are stopped here at the level of the testis. And it's okay because... The sperm are stored for, you know, 40, 60 days, and then they'll be reabsorbed after that time. So it's not a big deal. So they can build up and then be reabsorbed, and the whole process just continues and continues and continues. Uh, an important point to be made, yet again, uh, this ductus deferens is incredibly muscular, so it can pump sperm up from the testis when the time comes, and the tail of the epididymis is where they are stored in their mature forms, ready to do what they do. Um, just a little nuance, that is indeed a seminiferous tubule, and these structures in the background are Leydig cells, those are Leydig cells, uh, they are endocrine and they produce testosterone that ha kind of fuels this whole system, so you might want to keep that in mind. Alright, uh, from the testis up the um, uh, ductus deferens, vas deferens, they are going to run up into the ampullae of the ductus deferens, dumping down with the seminal vesicles into the prostate via the ejaculatory duct, uh, where they are going to be squeezed violently and pressed out of the system. Uh, so ampullae of the ductus deferens, ejaculatory duct, urethra, out of the body. All right. Uh, now, the accessory glands that are found here are very important. We have the seminal vesicles, as I said, this prostate, and we have the bulbo-urethral glands. And I just want to run through these real quick. Let's, let's do bulbo-urethral first, because it's pretty straightforward. Again, 
uh, this gland, the bulbo urethra gland, is going to produce an alkaline fluid that sort of washes out the urethra and uh, prevents any acidity from augmenting the sperm. Sperm don't do well in an acidic environment, so they are going to buffer the urethra early on pre-ejaculation uh, to prevent that from being a problem. And the theory here is that the production of these bulbo-urethral glands here on either side of the bulb of the penis, bulbo-urethral, bulb-urethra, all right, uh, are thought of as producing a mucus which is very slick that is theoretically going to lubricate the uh, glands of the penis prior to copulation. Now, the seminal vesicles and the prostate gland, both muscular, both capable of strong muscular contractions leading to that ej ejaculation that we've been talking about. And the secretions from these, uh, the seminal vesicles produce about 70% of what we call semen, uh, whereas the prostate gland produces about 30%. Uh, and both of these produce a number of other things which are incredibly important. Uh, for instance, the seminal vesicles, the production they make is incredibly alkaline, which is very important. Uh, the seminal fluids have to buffer the acidic environment of the vagina if you want to have a child. All right, For the sperm to survive in the vaginal environment, passing through the cervix, getting into the uterus, they have to, uh, the, the seminal fluids, have to neutralize the acidic environment of the of the vagina. So if you know anything about uh, like what do you call it uh, medications for yeast infections, as an example, what they're trying to do is they're trying to get the pH of the vagina back to its natural pH range, which is in the neighborhood of about 3.5. So what these fluids are going to do is take it up to about 7.5 on the basic side, a little bit of alkalinity, and that makes the sperm very capable of surviving for days and days inside of the female reproductive tract prior to fertilization. Uh, also built into this, the seminal vesicles release a lot of fructose, and that fructose as a sugar is going to be utilized by the sperm as an energy source to propel them from place to place and keep them alive for a period of time prior to fertilization. Again, it can take days for fertilization to occur. Uh, so this, this fluid and its production are there to keep those sperm alive. Uh, yeah, and also built into this, let's see, where do I have it? A lot of prostaglandins in there. Ah, oh, jeez, there's so much to talk about, folks. Uh, so the theory is that the seminal vesicles, the prostaglandins that they release... By the way, when you read prostaglandins, you think prostate gland. Prostaglandins are made all over the body. Prostate, or prostaglandins are made by females. Like, they're all over the place, so don't overthink that. Uh, but the prostaglandins are thought from the seminal vesicles, are thought of as being capable of uh, sort of relaxing the cervix, of breaking down mucus found in the cervix, and actually stimulating uh, uterine contractions, very minor uterine contractions, which may be involved in pulling sperm up into the uterus. Uh, for a long time, it was thought that the uterus would really uh, contract in a way, uh, almost like a suction pump, to pull uh, semen up into the uterus. I mean, that was common. I could pr probably find a reference to that in your textbook, but it, it's probably not the case in more recent studies that's been shown not quite to be true. All right. All right, I think that'll do. Muscular enzymes, lots of enzymes, that's true. Uh, oh, and the uh, production of the prostate gland activates the sperm to get their tails a kicking uh, so that they can then propel their own way once they get to the female reproductive system. Yeah. Yeah, that'll do. Let's go here. All right, let's talk about spermatogenesis. So spermatogenesis is the process of sperm production in these seminiferous tubules. Again, you can see our Leydig cells here producing testosterone that helps to regulate this whole system. You can see the developing sperm as they're moving in towards the core of this tube, and you can see the tails of the sperm spiraling through here with peristaltic contractions from what are called myeloid cells built into this system. Do I? Can you see it? Yeah, look, there's one myeloid cell right there. All right, so spermatogenesis is broken down into three uh, basic concepts. These are going to be spermatogonial mitosis, i.e. Fir uh, firming, forming the spermatocytes, Second is going to be meiosis, or meiotic divisions, which are going to take those spermatocytes and break them down into haploid subunits, all right? So we're making haploid sperm here in this meiotic bit. Um, and also in here, 
you're going to have a lot of genetic shuffling that's going to occur, and I'll be showing you that in just a second. The idea here is that sperm which are released don't remotely uh, match the genetic code of dad. Uh, they will have a lot of genetic variation as a result of the shuffling that occurs here. So it's not like, okay, mom gives dad, or hang on, let's, let's try this in English. You have half your genetics from mom, half your genetics from the, your dad. The offspring you produced are not going to be 50% almost identical to your father or mother. Uh, there's a crazy amount of genetic shuffling that takes place so that the gametes you produce are a mixture of your own genetics, okay? A really strong mixture. Also worthy of note here is spermatogenesis. One uh, spermatocyte, if you will, one spermatocyte will lead to the production of four functioning sperm, whereas in oogenesis or egg formation, one functioning oocyte will lead to one functioning oocyte, okay? Here you're making four sperm out of one spermatocyte, in oogenesis, one egg from one egg. Oh, and the last part of this is called spermiogenesis, which is basically the finalizing of the sperm and putting them in their uh, usable formats. All right, so let's run through it. So at puberty, uh, your testosterone levels will rise dramatically as a result of a whole host of influences. And what this is going to lead to is the production of sperm at about 13 or 14 years of age. All right. <clears throat> How this works is as follows. You'll have spermatogonial cells. These are almost like sperm-based stem cells, all right? They're hanging out way at the edge of these seminiferous tubules, okay? Uh, those are going to develop mitotically. They're going to split into two cells, type A daughter cells and type B daughter cells. The type A daughter cells will remain at the uh, spermatogonia and just serve to replicate and replicate and replicate, making more type B cells. And the type B cells are going to grow a bit and then move down and develop into what are called primary spermatocytes. This primary spermatocyte is going to go through meiosis, okay? Meiosis 1, uh, making it into a haploid cell. So they go from diploid to haploid after meiosis 1. And they're going to go into meiosis 2, which is basically just mitosis at this stage, and produce 1, 2, 3, 4... Um, uh, early spermatids, which will develop into four functioning sperm. So, note the chromosomal count. Primary spermatocytes diploid goes through meiosis, becomes haploid. Note that the uh, nature of all of this as it progresses with these spermatogonial cells all the way down. All right, now, the spermatids here... Uh, that are produced the, at the um, end of the day. These are non-functional. They are haploid. They've got everything they need to be sperm, but these are not sperm. Okay, They are not working yet. They are not there. They have to mature a bit, and that's going to be way on down here. Um, I just want to make a quick point about gamete formation. Again, I want you to know the difference between haploid and diploid cells. Your adult cells are diploid, but the gametes you produce are going to be haploid, be that an egg or a sperm, meaning they will contain 23 chromosomes here, 23 chromosomes here, bring those two together, and you produce a zygote, which has 46 total chromosomes, or 23 pair, or it would be considered diploid, or it is 2N, all the same reference material, all right? Just be able to use the terms haploid and diploid. Know that meiosis is the production of haploid gametes. Now, Meiosis also does another very important step, as I alluded to here. Shuffling of genes. This process is called crossing over, and it looks something like this. Now, I'm not going to hit you real hard with this. I just want to make a point, and that is that in meiosis 1, your chromosomes get together and they synapse. What that means is they twist and wrap and twist and wrap all over one another, and eventually parts will break off of one and stick to the other, and then parts will break off the other and stick to the one, and what have you. So at the end of the day, we get gamete chromosomes that don't perfectly match the original homologous pairs of your parental chromosomes. So the chromosomes you get from mom, chromosomes you get from dad, the gametes you produce don't perfectly match those, is the idea. Uh, and in fact, this happens multiple times, and results in ridiculous amounts of variation, like trillions of different sperm can be produced by a single male, trillions of genetically different eggs can produced, uh, be produced by a single female. Yeah, huge, huge amounts of variety. Um, yeah, yeah, it's perfect. 
crossing over. That's what that's called. And that takes us to here for spermiogenesis. So spermiogenesis is the making of functional sperm. And what we're going to do is we're going to take these cells, we're going to move them into the epididymis, and we're going to finalize them, get them ready to do what they're supposed to do. We're going to make them into spermatozoa or functioning animal-like sperm. And what does that entail? Well, the end of this thing referred to as the head is going to develop into what's called an acrosome. The acrosome has... Um, enzymes here that will assist in burrowing through an egg's membrane. So the acrosome has enzymes that allow it to basically tunnel through uh, the surface of an egg in order to fertilize it. Uh, the finalized sperm here have a pile of specialized microtubules that form up a flagellum. And then in the midpiece of the sperm, uh, you'll find just piles of mitochondria. And these mitochondria are going to use the fructose in the seminal fluid as a fuel and energy source produce ATP and allow for this tail, this flagellum, to propel the sperm from one place to another. Yeah, so the whole concept here is we're streamlining. We're taking uh, the sperm here as a spermatid. I got an actual real spermatid here, you can see it, and we're stripping all that cytoplasm away, basically just leaving behind a little bit of genetic material this acrosome to allow this sperm cell to burrow through an egg cell, and then this tail with its midpiece packed with mitochondria uh, so that it can utilize all the fructose in seminal fluids and propel itself from place to space. Uh, place to space? Well, uh, you get my point. Um, now, mature sperm, sperm is born about 70 days. Yeah, so from start to finish, about a 70-day period. And that takes us to here. Oh, man, let me tell you. Let's talk about Masters and Johnson. Male sexual response. Now, what follows uh, is a result of Masters and Johnson, whom published their legendary text on human sexuality in the 60s. Man, it, it revolutionized science at the time and our understanding of sexual physiology, if you will. Uh, up until that point, there were texts on the subject. But they were pretty hopeless. <laughs> pretty hopeless as to uh, really understanding how copulation takes place and how it all functions together. Uh, you just, you would not believe it. I mean, uh, pause this, pause this uh, video and just go type in Mary Roach, Mary Roach, in the YouTube and watch some videos by Mary Roach if you want to really delve into the depths of uh, human sexual research up until Masters and Johnson, you should totally read Mary Roach's book. Uh, it is an eye-opening experience. <laughs> Terrifying, all the same. Uh, so with that in mind, let's talk about the work of Masters and Johnson and uh, move on from there. So imagine yourself being a scientist and realizing that our understanding of human sexuality is limited, to say the least and then going and trying to get funding to do scientific research, trying to get hired on at a college uh, so that you can conduct scientific research in an appropriate laboratory and they ask you what you're gonna do and your response is you're gonna bring in as many couples as you can and have them wear a variety of sensors and then have cameras all over the place to record them in copulo as a means of generating incredibly, incredibly detailed numerical measurements of everything you can imagine during the process. Yeah, yeah, that had not really been done up to this stage. So Masters and Johnson are, can really be credited. Uh, there, I think there's a TV show about them. Uh, you should, I've not seen it, but I, I know that it exists. Uh, they, they lived interesting lives, let's say, but they did develop our modern knowledge of how uh, sexual reproduction works today, as well as figuring out certain therapies for sexual dysfunction. Yeah, Masters and Johnson. I've never put a picture that big of a group of folks on a slide before. They are important. They are important. And one, <laughs> one of the few pictures of uh, William Masters where he doesn't look like a weirdo. <laughs> Personal opinion. All right, here we go. <clears throat> so, anatomical foundations. You, the, the penis is organized in a kind of fascinating way. What we have is a, a dorsal artery, okay? Dorsal arteries coming in here on the sides. 
uh, a dorsal vein on the outside of a band of connective tissue and a dorsal vein called the deep dorsal vein on the inside of this band of connecting tissue. There are deep penal arteries that are associated with what are called the corpus cavernosa. And again, down here at the corpus spongiosa, you will see that these are connective tissue based and they are sectioned off from one another. And that's very important. Uh, let me see if I've skipped anything here. Dorsal arteries, fly brilliant, yep, 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 yep. Dilation of the deep arteries causes a filling of the corpus cavernosa, that's erectile tissue. Uh, yeah, and then the deep dorsal vein would drain blood from this. It's a weird process, folks, but I'm going to do my best to give you a very brief explanation of it. What will happen is uh, blood gets pumped into these deep penile arteries, and that blood will fill the corpus cavernosa, and just specifically, and as they fill, they will fill up this chamber here that surrounds the whole thing, and when they... When they fill, they put pressure against the veins that would then drain the area. And by putting pressure against those veins, blood can't run through them, so the penis becomes erect. It's just how it works. So when the penis is going to become no longer erect, uh, a little bit of blood loss here results in blood being able to flow back through these veins which are found here, and uh, the, the uh, penis loses the erection quite quickly. But the nature of it is that these corpus cavernosa fill fast as a result of these deep penile arteries and pressurize this internal chamber and put pressure against these veins, as you can see here, and that results in a lack of blood loss, but blood still pumping in and fills these chambers, causing, uh, in essence, what we call a hydrostatic skeleton, a fluid-based skeleton. Yeah. Uh, and a little bit of a conversation to be had on the neural network, if you will, of male reproductive parts. Uh, there are a variety of nerve endings here, and this is going to be able to pre uh, pick up pressure and touch and temperature variances, you name it, all of which are going to be going to the brain. And then, interestingly, you're going to have influence from both the sympathetic division and the parasympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system to control general penal function, okay? They're going to serve different purposes, okay? Different purposes. Uh, so with that in mind, and I'm going to get more into this here in just a moment, I just want to quickly mention semen and talk about what's in it and how it functions, all right? So seminal fluid that will be released during ejaculation will be between 2 and 5 milliliters. In other words, not a lot of material at all. And of this, about 60% is coming from the vesicles, about 30% from the prostate, and about an excess 10% will be from the sperm itself, vulva urethral gland, what have you. Uh, sperm count is ner normally between 50 and 120 million per milliliter. So imagine, imagine even on the low end of the spectrum here, how many sperm you're getting. Uh, and the idea is that during normal ejaculation, if that count is below about 25 million, uh, you would be considered um, incapable of reproducing in essence. You'd have a low chance of having a baby. Uh, now, this solution is quite alkaline, and the reason it's alkaline is to buffer the uh, vaginal pH, and semen itself, it, it displays a very sticky texture, and there's a reason for that, all right? Uh, there are protein networks inside of this, as released, that will form a very sticky matrix, if you will. Uh, it sort of goops everything together, and the concept of this is that it'll get to the cervix and form what we call a... Um, sperm plug, if you will, at the cervix. So it sort of embeds itself in there and sticks together uh, so that post-copulation it doesn't just drain out of the system. Now after a period of time, 20 or 30 minutes, uh, the proteases from the prostate, some of these enzymes that are involved here, will break down these protein networks and then the uh, sperm becomes active and begins to swim, okay? Also built into the system around that same time period, the prostaglandins uh, that we talked about previously are going to cause the mucus of the cervix to relax, become thinner, and then allow uh, for peristaltic waves in the uterus to pull sperm up and direct them towards the egg. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> let's talk about how this works. So let's go back to Masters and Johnson. There are four phases in terms of copulation. These four phases are excitement, the plateau, orgasm, and then resolution. So 
becoming interested, the physical process, the culminating result of the process, and what happens afterwards. And away we go. So excitement phased. Uh, it's going to be characterized by general excite or ex excitement phase characterized by excitement. Uh, increased muscle tone, heart rate's going to rise, blood pressure goes up, pulmonary ventilation increases. All of these are sympathetic nervous system responses. But built in and amongst this is general vasocongestion of the penis itself, i.e. erection, swelling, or what we call tumescence. Okay, tumescence is the act of swelling. And the actual erection here is triggered by the parasympathetic nervous system, causing an increase of nitric oxide. This results in a dilation of those blood vessels there. The penis swells. It closes off those venous networks. And, um, yeah, yeah, it's going to become erect. And built in with these hormone variances, the testes also dramatically increase in size in most cases. It can become up to 50% larger. Uh, during intercourse. All right, so sympathetic division causes all these effects. Generally speaking, the parasympathetic division causes the physical erection itself. Plateau. This is the act of the process. Uh, the So uh, respiratory rates stay high, heart rates stay high, blood pressure stay high. Um, yeah, this can last for seconds. This can last four minutes. There's a wide variety, right? But this is the physical act of copulation, followed by orgasm or climax, uh, clim climax, climax, uh, a short but intense um, physiological response marked by discharge of semen. Uh, the physical orgasm itself can last between three and 15 seconds. And during this, you'll see really high heart rate, blood pressure, uh, ventilation rate, what have you. All of these are, again, driven by the sympathetic division of the motor nervous system. I would not be surprised um, to see, like, dilated pupils as an example. This is a fight-or-flight reaction in the grand scheme. And afterwards, so, well, actually, not yet. We're not there yet. So the, one more little nuance to say here. Uh, there are two variations that occur with ejaculation. This is emission and expulsion. Okay, emission is basically the process of bringing the sperm to the point of the urethra. Okay, nervous system stimulates peristalsis, which propels sperm through the ducts, and glandular secretions are added, building the semen. Basically, getting everything to the urethra, and then you have expulsion. So the semen in the urethra will activate the sympathetic nervous system to cause a variety of muscular reflexes that stimulate crazy contractions, leading to the expulsion of uh, the semen containing sperm um, from the urethra. Yeah. Yeah. Now, fascinating in and amongst this is the bladder is closed off during this process. Otherwise, these crazy muscular contractions might propel some degree of semen up into the bladder. That cannot happen because the, in, um, I think the external urethral sphincter is closed at that stage. Uh, but anyway, the, the urethral sphincter is going to be closed as a result of this process. And also, fascinatingly, ejaculation and orgasm are not the same. Okay? These things can occur at separate times. You can get one and not the other. There's a whole variety of things can happen. But these are the terms that are associated with this, all right? Emission, getting everything down to the penis, and then expulsion, uh, the release from the penis as a result of uh, muscular contractions, followed by a resolution phase. Uh, so this is going to be characterized by what we call detumescence. So tumescence is the erection of the penis, uh, filling with blood. Detumescence is simply the opposite of that. Um, cardiovascular network slows down. The sympathetic um, nervous signals relax. The heart rate decreases. Ventilation decreases. There is a cool-down period, if you will, folks. That's what's happening here post-coitus. Uh, and followed by a refractory period. So the refractory period in males... Uh, is going to be incapable of producing an erection, can last between 10 minutes and hours, and this will change with uh, lifespan. So you got to imagine like a, a teenage male uh, could be capable of sustaining an erection again very, very quickly, uh, whereas a 60-year-old man, uh, you're looking at a long period of time prior to the chance of attaining an erection. So it changes with age. All right, changing gears here. I, I wanted to talk about just a few more things. 
uh, dealing with the hormones that are in play here prior to cutting you loose on this. So let's discuss the hormones which regulate male reproduction and then call it a day. The hormones in play here are driven by the hypothalamus, the anterior pituitary gland, and the testes. And this whole system is referred to as an HPG axis, or what we'll call the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis, okay? Uh, because all of these are involved. And what hormones are in play? Well, a whole variety. Uh, GnRH here, gonadotropin releasing hormone, is going to be in play. Uh, FSH, or follicle stimulating hormone, is going to be in play. Luteinizing hormone, oh, forgot that end parenthesis here, is going to be in play. Obviously, testosterone is going to play a role, and in heaven is going to play a role. Now, some of you should recognize some of these as being female in their origin. Follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, these are thought of as being uh, female hormones, but they play a major role in the male also. So when we say follicle stimulating hormone, we tend to be talking about ovarian follicles. They play a role in the male system as well. When we talk about luteinizing hormone, we tend to think about corpus luteum. It also plays a role in the male system, just like we both make testosterone, just like we both make estrogen. We're more similar than you think. All right, here we go. Uh, read it all. Read it all. All right, read it all. It's a neat little story to tell. Uh, I'm going to give you the dime tour, and what I'm going to give you is mainly what I want in terms of exam. All right, away we go. So what happens is um, the hypothalamus, way up top here, releases gonadotropin-releasing hormone, it travels down the bloodstream into the anterior pituitary, and it causes the anterior pituitary to release uh, follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. So gonadotropin-releasing hormone causes the release of luteinizing hormone and follicle-stimulating hormone. Now, in this, the follicle-stimulating hormone here basically just acts in a way to keep the resting level of testosterone high and that will indirectly uh, increase spermatogenesis. So you need testosterone for spermatogenesis to occur, and what follicle-stimulating hormone does is it keeps the level of testosterone elevated, okay? Uh, so follicle-stimulating hormone enhances testosterone's effect by keeping its levels high. Now, luteinizing hormone here uh, acts upon the Leydig cells, or uh, what do they call them? They got a name for them around here someplace. Uh, the interstitial endocrine cells, they're Leydig cells, all right? They're, these are Leydig cells, interstitial endocrine cells being fancy, but they're Leydig cells. And what it does is it triggers them to produce testosterone and estrogen, okay? The Leydig cells make testosterone and a little bit of estrogen and will uh, increase spermatogenesis. Now, that testosterone here, produced here, not only does it act on the testes themselves, but this is going to leave there and go out and bring about a whole host of bodily effects, including those secondary sexual characteristics. Uh, do I have that on here someplace? Body stimulates maturation of sex organs, development, maintenance of secondary sexual characteristics, libido and sex drive play into this. Oh my gosh, go and watch TV for five minutes and see how many commercials you see about low T. Uh, the idea there being that as males age, they tend to produce less testosterone, and what that does is it drives down libido, and you're less interested in sex as a result of that. So there are a whole host of drugs out there that are supposed to increase your testosterone levels um, and thus increase general libido. Okay, now, feedback time. Let's change gear a little bit. When testosterone... <clears throat> when testosterone levels are high, this causes a negative feedback loop, okay? So high testosterone inhibits follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone release as a result of uh, preventing uh, gonadotropin-releasing hormone from doing its thing, okay? So when sperm counts high as a result of lots of testosterone, you're going to inhibit uh, gonadotropin-releasing hormone, and that's going to slow this whole process down if not stop it, okay? Uh, when sperm count is low, that basically says there's not enough testosterone, you're gonna be cranking out gonadotropin-releasing hormone, and this process is gonna be amped up. So it is a uh, cycle. If there's enough sperm being made, then you 
will slow down the whole process of making testosterone. If there's not enough sperm being made, you're going to make more testosterone as a result of releasing gonadotropin releasing hormone. Now, built into this whole thing is inhibin. Um, And inhibin, quite simply, just acts on the release of follicle-stimulating hormone. All right, so let's make sure we're together. This is a homeostatic process. Not enough sperm, you need more testosterone. You're releasing good androgen, releasing hormone. It's releasing uh, follicle-stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone. Plenty of sperm, you need less testosterone, which means less gonadotropin releasing hormone. Yeah, I think that'll do. Now, this is a delicate process, and it really starts going at puberty, and as a result of that, testosterone levels are just wildly variable uh, during puberty, but the process is going to stabilize after about three year, uh, years post-onset. So by the time a male is 14 or 15, uh, this system is stable, and testosterone production is stable, and sperm production is stable. All right, uh, plasma testosterone and sperm production at age variants. Long story short, um, very early in development in utero, there's going to be a spike of testosterone that's going to drive the development of the male parts internally. At birth, just post, there's another little spike of testosterone. I don't know exactly why that is, though I, I should look that up. But then at puberty, the amount of testosterone really ramps up and then stabilizes. So this process, after a period of time, will stabilize general uh, testosterone levels and it will remain stable until you get older. And as we age, testosterone levels will again begin to drop. And that takes us back to uh, wherever it was. We were talking about low T. It's in here someplace. Uh, decreasing libido, as it were. And I'm pretty happy with that. That's really all I want to say uh, in terms of how this works. And last but not least, I just wanted to throw this slide up there. It was found, I found this at the end of your text basically just outlining the effects of testosterone. Again, um, variations in hair appearance and location, certainly different in terms of males and females as a result of the testosterone found here. Uh, augmentations of hair growth in other areas, larynx enlargement and a deepening of the voice, uh, toughening of the skin, variations in bone growth, uh, and density, so testosterone has a huge effect on how the bones develop and general bone density. Even the geometry of the skeleton between males and females is very different, just very different. Uh, you should totally go and look up hip widths and uh, pelvic weight and uh, the, the angle of the knees as a result of the width of the pelvis is just so different between males and females. It's such a neat thing, all driven by testosterone. Uh, bone growth, bone density, skeletal muscle variances that occur as a result of testosterone. Again, you know, most of these anabolic steroids that you hear about, like baseball players taking and what have you, uh, these are all going to drive up testosterone. I should totally show you that. Do I have time? It may have been on the first... Anyway, I'm not going to worry about it. Um, and again, this is going to drive metabolic rate and libido, okay? So the whole male system is going to be driven by this testosterone and its effect upon the body. Um, and worthy of mention here is that steroids can really play hell with this, all right? Get on my soapbox a little bit. I had a friend that had all kind of problems as a result of steroids, so I feel like it's kind of like a public service announcement, something worthy of saying here. Um, when you are taking steroids that basically mimic the effects of testosterone, it just screws this whole system all up. So a person that's been taking steroids for a while, they're going to have itty bitty little tiny testes because the testes atrophy because the body's getting testosterone from somewhere else. Uh, they're going to have incredibly low sperm count. I mean, it just plays hell with the whole system. Uh, you're you're going to be sterilizing the body. So a person that takes steroids for a long period of time, they're going to basically become sterile as a result of that. So stay the hell away from steroids, I think is my take-home message here, uh, because it just throws all of this just absolutely crazy. And again, all of these effects that you see here, uh, you can see them triggered in females whom are taking testosterone-based uh, drugs, uh, i.e. Uh, bodybuilders or what have you. You can see these same effects. 
um, even developing uh, male reproductive structures in some cases, it, it blow your mind uh, what happens when a person who is not exposed to high degrees of testosterone becomes exposed to high degrees of testosterone. So it's a really neat thing. Uh, sexual reproduction is a fascinating story to tell. And that is our first probably two-thirds being that we introduced all this stuff and introduced all these hormones and introduced general functionality. That's how the male reproductive system is organized. And we'll throw in how the female reproductive system is organized shortly. And it should be a much more simplistic lecture being that we've already covered all these other details. All right. Thanks so much, folks. I hope this works out for you and expect another lecture soon. Thank you.